morning and welcome to the Indian Hill Church on this Trinity Sunday. Let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful. to worship. The voice of the Lord rings out over the waters. The love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit washes over the world. Let us worship the God whose voice flashes fire and whose love cannot be bound. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Let us listen to God's holy and God's living word. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do this, these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. For what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. For the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? For no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, today is Trinity Sunday, the most notoriously dreaded Sunday for preachers in the entire liturgical year. It's a rare Sunday in which the focus is not so much on a particular biblical text as it is a theological idea. In many churches, this is the Sunday when the associate or the curate is most likely to preach, while the rector sits back and ticks off heresy after heresy. 
But at a place like Indian Hill, where the fifth Sunday of any given month is a toss-up, well, I guess I just got plain unlucky. This past week, I was looking through my old sermons, and I found that somehow I've not yet been stuck with preaching on Trinity Sunday. So I suppose now is as good a time as any to offer up my futile attempt. The Holy Trinity is simultaneously the most misunderstood and the most prevalent Christian theological doctrine. Though in the Episcopal liturgy it's hard to find a single prayer that does not end in some way by acknowledging the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it might surprise you to learn that neither the word Trinity nor the explicit principle actually appear in the Bible at all. Of course, all the ingredients for such a doctrine can be found in the text, but it wasn't until the third century, by way of the Council of Nicaea, that the Trinity became a doctrine all on its own. And though I must be truthful, that even though I'm a priest, I still lack real Trinitarian understanding. But my ego is comforted by the fact that throughout history, many scholars have had a hard time getting this thing right. Try to make sense of it using analogies or metaphorical ideas, and you'll quickly find yourself representing a number of ancient Trinitarian heresies. The Trinity is like water, for example, H2O. It can be found in three forms, right? Liquid, ice, and vapor. Wrong. That would be modalism, my friends. Condemned at the First Council of Constantinople, this third century heresy espouses that God isn't three distinct persons exactly, but simply reveals himself in three different forms. Hmm. Perhaps we could relate the Trinity to the sun. The sun is itself a star and gives off light and heat. Yikes! You've now found yourself defending Arianism, the unorthodox notion that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are creations of God the Father and therefore not co-equal with him. I suppose, at the very least, you could make sense of the Trinity by way of one of its most well-known symbols, a St. Patrick-style three-leaf clover. Er, now we've waded our way into partialism, the heresy that teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not three distinct persons of the Godhead, but are instead different parts of God, essentially dividing God out into thirds, and that is a major no-no. If you're feeling dizzy and a bit nauseous by all of this, you aren't alone. And if you've believed one of these ancient heresies at some point in time, well, you can see me after the service for confession. As the writer and Episcopal priest, the Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor once put it, when human beings try to describe God, we are like a bunch of oysters trying to describe a ballerina. We simply do not have the equipment necessary to understand something so utterly beyond us that has never stopped us from trying. Though there isn't anything necessarily wrong with attempting to make sense of God, I remain convinced more and more each year it seems that any efforts to explicate, grasp, or comprehend God are simply ludicrous. Trinity is a mystery which cannot be explained, and that, my friends, is the point. One of my favorite teachers once said to me that the more you love something, the harder and harder it becomes to articulate it. I sometimes wonder why God is so mystifying to us. Is it because God is distant from us? far and away and out of reach? Or do we find God perplexing precisely because God is so near? Like looking into a microscope is the image so close that our feeble human minds are unable to place God into the appropriate landscape. Is it possible that the nearer our hearts are tethered to this triune one, 
the more difficult it becomes to coherently communicate anything about God other than love. Professor and scholar at Duke Divinity School, Dr. Jeremy Begbie, contends that the mistake many of us make when it comes to the Trinity is trusting our eyes more than our ears. He reminds us that there's a very big difference in the way that we see the world versus the way we hear the world. In the world that we see, we can't ever perceive two different things in the same space at the same time as different. One always blocks the other. Or in the case of color, for instance, two colors become something altogether different, losing their innately distinctive properties. We can't see the colors blue and red at the same place at the same time. They will always become purple. But in the world that we hear, that's not the case. In thinking about music, if you hear a note played on the piano or the guitar or the cello, one note fills up your entire auditory space. But when you add a second note to the original one, playing two notes at the same time, both fill the same oral space. And yet, they can still also be heard as different. History has taught us that trying to visualize the Trinity as one God in three persons is very difficult. You either see three decided gods or one big one without much delineation. But in the world of sound, a three-note chord inhabits one singular space and yet all three notes can be heard distinctly. The notes resonate and enhance one another in the same way that the three-personed God is involved in a playful dance. Perhaps what makes the Trinity so perplexing can be traced back to our over-reliance on our sight of seeing things just as they are, our fervent desire for the world to fit neatly into our categorized boxes. And maybe, if we want to seek a deeper understanding of God, we must begin to rely on that which is untouchable, that which is beyond our grasp. We might find ourselves to be more at home in the perplexity of poetry or music, those things that we can't quite put our finger on. On this Trinity Sunday, if you leave this place more confused than when you arrived, then I just might have done something right here. May you continue to grapple with this glorious mystery which is so central to our life of faith. May you be leery of accepting easy answers and half-truths, trusting the world you hear more than the one you see. And may the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. On this Memorial Day weekend, let us offer up a prayer for our country and for those in the armed forces. Almighty God, who has entrusted us this good land for our heritage, we humbly ask that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of your favor and glad to do your will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people, the multitudes brought here out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in your name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to your law, 
we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in you to fail. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a prayer for those in the armed forces. Almighty God, we commend to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Father's God, unto thee, Father of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with green of holy light, protect us. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may God be with us this day and forever. Amen. 